Greetings, everyone. My name is Mike Posner. Welcome. Here we are. I think it's safe to say I'm playing for perhaps some uh, meditators out there. So if you would indulge me, I'd like to start this set with just a few deep breaths. I'm going to invite you to close your eyes. Take a breath in with me. Let it go. Take a breath in with me. Let it go. Take a breath in. Let it go. I invite you to keep your eyes closed. And I'm going to play you a song that I wrote after a night in the studio with a friend of mine. We were passing the guitar back and forth. He played me a song, I played him a song. I played him another song. He said, Mike, what's this tune about? I said, it's about a girl I had a thing with in New York. And then the rest of it I just kind of made up. And in a way that reminded me of Neem Karoli Baba telling Ram Dass, love everyone and tell the truth. My friend looked at me and said, why don't you just tell the truth? Why do you have to make it up? So that night I wrote this. It's called. I took a pill in Ibiza to show Avicii I was cool And when I finally got sober Felt ten years older Oh, fuck it, it was something to do I'm living out in L.A. I drive a sports car just to prove I'm a real big baller Cause I made a million dollars And I spend it on girls and shoes You don't wanna be higher like me Never really knowing why you like me You don't never wanna step off that road and be all alone You don't want to ride the bus like this Never knowing who to trust like this You don't want to be stuck up on that stage singing Stuck up on that stage singing All I know Are sad songs Sad songs I gotta know Our sad songs, sad songs I'm just a singer who already blew a shot I get along with old timers, my name's a reminder of a pop song people forgot And I can't keep a girl, no Because as soon as the sun comes up I cut them all loose and work's my excuse The truth is I can't open up That you don't want to be higher like me You don't ever know why you like me You don't ever want to step off that roller coaster And be all alone And you don't want to ride the bus like this Never knowing who to trust like this You don't want to be stuck up on that stage singing Stuck up on that stage singing Our sad songs, sad songs, I don't know, I know, our sad songs, sad songs. Plane to my hometown. 
I brought my pride and my guitar. Well, my friends are all gone, but there's manicured lawns and the people still think I'm a star. I walked around downtown. I met some fans on Lafayette. They said, Mike, tell us how to make it. We're getting real impatient. I looked him in the eyes and said, you don't want to be high and like me. Never really knowing why and like me. You don't ever want to step off that roller coaster and be all alone. And you don't ever want to ride the bus like this. Never knowing who to trust like this. You don't want to be stuck up on this Zoom singing. Stuck up on this Zoom singing Oh, I know Our sad songs Sad songs Darling, no That I know Our sad songs Sad run away from these lines back to yesterday say tonight I feel the sun creeping up like tick tock I'm trying to keep you in my head but if not we'll just keep running from tomorrow with our lips locked yeah, you got me begging, begging Baby, please don't go If I wake up tomorrow Will you still be here? I don't know If you feel the way I do Believe I'm gonna find you Baby, please don't go, 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 go Baby, please don't go, 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 go Baby, please don't go. Baby, please don't, baby, please don't run away from my bed and start another day. Stay instead. I feel the sun creeping up light. I'm trying to keep you in my head, but if not, we'll just keep running. Baby, please don't go If I wake up tomorrow, will you still be here? I don't know, no, no You the way I do You leave, I'm gonna find you Baby, please don't go, 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 go Baby, please don't go, 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 go Baby, please don't go, 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 go. Baby, Fawik
wake up tomorrow, will you still be here? I don't know, no, no. If you feel the way I do, you leave, I'm gonna find you, baby. Please don't go, go, go. Be please don't go, 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 go. Baby, please don't go, 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 go. Baby, please don't. Baby, please don't. Baby, please don't run away. Thank you. Oh, did I ever tell you guys you could open your eyes? You could open your eyes two songs ago. <laughs> Some of you poor souls are in deep meditation out there. <laughs> Unreal. Uh, this next tune, um, and actually before I get into that, I want to say thank you to Raghu uh, for having me on. This is a real honor. Um, I'm here because um, Ram Dass changed my life. I had the opportunity to meet him um, when he was still in physical form, probably close to six, seven years ago. Um, it was after he was stroked. Um, through a friend, I was invited to his home in Maui. And uh, we went to the home. And uh, Ram Dass came into the room. He was in, in the uh, wheelchair. And he basically told stories to us that I'd heard him tell before. You know, all the famous ones about meeting the, his guru. And um, so there was really nothing about his words that, that was remarkable about that experience but I remember uh, we spoke for about 40 minutes or so um, one new thing I remember him saying to me was uh, you go through your life all day and you're constantly thinking what I like what I don't like judging what is good or this could be better he goes that's that's a lot of work that's a lot of work. He goes, it's a lot easier to just love everything and love everybody. That stuck with me. But even more than that quote um, was the feeling that my friends and I had. Um, we walked out of his home. We, yeah, we talked for about 40, 40 minutes. And then he said, it's time for you to go now. We said, thank you. I kissed him on the forehead. We walked out. And I remember walking outside. And it, it was as if someone had taken the, the governor off my heart. I felt connected to everything. Uh, the sun, the trees, the rusty gate, the dog shit, all of it. I felt in love with life and the universe itself. And that came from him just being him. Um, so that changed my life, right? I started this, this tirade by saying meeting Ram Dass changed my life. That changed my life because prior to that, I had been meditating and, you know, on my sadhana. But I didn't really know if it was real. Like, I didn't know if the shit worked. And when I met Ram Dass, I knew the shit worked because I felt it in my body just by being around him. My relationship with my own life improved in a major way. So then I decided, you know, I want to be like that. I want to make people feel like that when they're in the room with me. And I can't really think of a more important thing to do. And um, I didn't have a feeling like Ram Dass was supernatural or, or like had achieved something that I couldn't or that other people couldn't. Uh, it felt much more inspiring than that. Uh, it felt like, you know, if I go do the work on myself, that's attainable for me. Um, 
So I'm on that path. I think sometimes I hit the mark and others I don't for sure. <laughs> and I'm just trying to angle more towards, towards hitting the target more often as I think, you know, everyone on this call is. So, you know, I just wanted to share that. That's why I'm here. This song is called, Could You Do The Same? And it's a song I wrote uh, when my own father was making his transition. Dad was a beautiful man and uh, he was diagnosed with glioblastoma, that's cancer of the brain. And I had the privilege of going home and, and helping him with his transition. And this was a song that I wrote about that time to him. Could you do the same? You tell me that you can see your mother. I couldn't see her. That was my fault, it wasn't yours. And now I spit back these words I heard in Ram Das lectures. Make you feel better about what's in store. And everyone has their theory of where you're going. And here I am about to throw more words on top of that pile. Oh, I happen to think that you'll always know who I am. Your wings, you're gonna fly for a while, and that's all right with me. Flying, baby, fly. That's all right with me. Flying, baby, fly. I'm so tired of life inside the saddle. So I suspect that even mine will start to wane But I've got an idea that I'd like you to consider 
If I could love you without trying to change you, could you do the same? If I could love you without trying to change you, could you do the same? Thank you. So, after meeting Ram Das, after my dad making his transition, uh, I was living in LA. I had acquired a lot of material success um, from my music. Some of the songs I played you, and some of the songs I haven't played you, um, with the universe's blessing, became quite popular songs. Um, but despite all that, or maybe because of it, in 2019, I felt sort of trapped underneath the weight of my own life. and. I'd wake up in the morning and there just didn't feel like there was a compelling reason to get out of bed. So I went to talk to my friend Elliot who always exudes superhuman enthusiasm and I'm hoping that you know some of his positivity would transfer to me when I, when I call him. I said, you know Elliot, I'm just going on tour doing the whole Mike Posner show again. I just don't want to do it anymore. And he looked at me and he said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I have this dream of walking across America, but everyone thinks it's crazy. My manager thinks it's crazy. My agents think it's crazy. Family think it's crazy. He interrupts me and goes, that's great news. I said, what do you mean that's great news? He goes, that they think it's crazy. I'm confused now. So I say, what are you talking about, Elliot? He says, you got to understand, man. Not all crazy ideas are great. But all great ideas are crazy. And I felt the truth of what he was saying cascade through my body. And in that moment, I made a decision. I was going to do something that gave me a compelling reason to get out of bed in the morning. I, Mike Posner going to walk across America. So on April 15th, 2019, I stood in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of New Jersey and with saltwater waves crashing over my back, I took my first step towards the Pacific Ocean, which was 2,851 miles away. Step one is take one step. Step one is take one step. I typically walk 24 miles a day and I had decided to walk east to west. I walked with support. So I had a friend in an RV that would go ahead of me and I'd catch up to him. And I put on social media that anyone who wanted to walk with me could join. And people did so. They came from all over the world. That's not true. All over the country to walk with me. And when they came to walk with me, I always ask them two questions. The first was, why did you come here? And often they were just fans of my music and they wanted a picture. It was fine, took the picture, no problem. Other times, they just wanted to see if they could find me, like some sort of strange, strange scavenger hunt. But sometimes they came because they had no one else to talk to. Their fathers had also just died. They were high school seniors who didn't know what to do next. They were soldiers who had killed and seen killing. They were professionals who were trapped under the weight of their own lives. We each walked together healing in our own ways. One day a kid walked up, maybe he was ninth, 18, 19, and he said, I always want to walk across America also, Mike, but I can't do it now because I'm too young. First I gotta get a job, make money. Just a few days later I met a, met a man who was maybe 65. 
And he said, it was always my dream to walk across America, but I'm too old. I started to see the difference between reasons and excuses. And I realized that 99 times out of 100, our reasons are just excuses wearing fancy clothes. The second question I always asked people when they showed up to walk with me was, if I pray for you, what should I pray for? Usually it was a one word answer. It would say love, success, happiness, joy. But sometimes is a 21 year old named Rowan on the Wallapai reservation who looked at me and said, Five years ago, my father died. And three years ago, my only brother died. And just three months ago, my mom died. All from alcoholism. He said, if you pray for me, pray for my sobriety, because I'm the only one left. I walked across New Jersey. I walked across Pennsylvania, where I shared the road with Amish buggies. I walked across Ohio, where I saw a double rainbow. I walked across Indiana, developed excruciating foot pain, but I kept going. I walked across Illinois. I walked across Missouri during a heat wave where I stopped wearing shorts, leaving just my signature white tights. People said, Mike, you can't wear these tights, they're underwear, but I was walking outside 24 a day and it was hot, the humid brand of hot, the brand of hot where the weatherman goes on TV and says, don't go outside today, it's too hot. I'm gonna walk 24 in that hot, so white tights it is. I kept going, I walked across Missouri, I walked across Kansas, I walked into Colorado, I could just see the Rocky Mountains on the horizon. I had walked 1,797 miles since taking that first step, when ow! Pain shot up my left leg. And then I heard a sound that I didn't wanna hear. And I realized that a poisonous rattlesnake had just sunk its fangs into my left leg. Luckily, there were two fans with me that, with me that day, and one of them called 911. He let me speak to dispatch. Dispatch said, sir, you're sort of in the middle of nowhere. I've sent an ambulance from two different directions, so two different ambulances, and a helicopter. Whichever gets there first, get in. To which I said, am I gonna die? To which she said, I don't know, sir. An hour later, I was in the back of the ambulance headed to La Junta Hospital. It dawned on me, hey, you know, this could be my last few hours alive. And the thought after that was, if these are my last few hours alive, I ain't gonna waste them worrying about if they're gonna be my last few hours alive. I'm gonna enjoy my last few hours alive. And immediately after that, this deep presence washed over me. And I was just there. All the colors in the back of the ambulance got brighter. The red was alive and vibrant. I was in the ICU for three days. Uh, my legs swelled to the size of an elephant trunk and I went from walking 24 miles every day to not being able to walk to the bathroom without help. But thanks to amazing medical care at Parkview Hospital, 21 days after that snake bit me, 
I had healed up enough to go to the exact spot that it sunk its fangs into my leg and I took a step and I took another step. I kept taking steps until I'd walked up and over the Rocky Mountains. I kept taking steps until I walked across Colorado. I kept taking steps until I walked across Navajo Nation. I kept taking steps until I walked across Arizona. I kept taking steps until I walked across Nevada. I kept taking steps until I walked into California where people premature, prematurely congratulated me because I still had 300 miles to go. I kept taking steps until I walked across the Mojave Desert. I kept taking steps until I walked into Los Angeles. I kept taking steps. I saw the Hollywood sign on my right. I kept taking steps until the pavement turned into sand. Venice Beach, I kept taking steps and my walk escalated to a sprint and after six months, Three days, 2,851 miles, I dove into the Pacific Ocean. It felt like the first day of my life. This is the first day of my life I swear I was born right in the doorway And I don't know where I am, I don't know where I've been There's blankets on the beach Yours was the first face that I saw But I didn't die before I met you I don't know where I am, I don't know where I've been, but I know where I want to go. And so I thought I'd let you know. These things take forever, I especially am slow. But I realized that I need you, and I wondered if I could come. The time you drove all night Just to meet me in the morning And I thought it was strange You said everything changed You felt as if you'd just woke up You said This is the first day of my life I'm glad I didn't die before I met you Care, I could go anywhere with you, and I'd probably be happy. So, if you want to be with me, with these things, there's no telling, you just have to wait and see. I'd rather, woo, but I'd rather be working for a paycheck than waiting to win the lottery. I mean, I really think you like me. It's happening now. I can feel it all around. I said it's happening. I look at the look in your eyes It's happening now I can feel it all around Oh, it's happening now Feel it all around Darling, take a breath, slow it down with you some way somehow I said take a breath slow it down 
I am with you some way and somehow and it's, it's happening now I can feel it all around Thank you. Thank you guys so much. My name is Mike Posner. Uh, I love you. I appreciate you. Um, you're in my heart. And uh, many blessings to you in this day. Go get them. Bye. All right. So we're back with Mike Posner. Mike, thank you so much for that amazing set and the storytelling. It was just absolutely beautiful. And you were just so present and wonderful. And we really just appreciate that. Thank you. It was fun to do. Yeah, it was really sweet. I love the combination of the storytelling and the music. It was like a real, a real immersive experience. Cool. Um, so since we have so many people on this call that um, mm -hmm. are into Ram Dass and into mindfulness and meditation and spiritual practice, and a lot of people are sort of on their spiritual journeys, I thought I would just ask a couple of questions around that. Um, so, I mean, everyone knows that mindfulness doesn't take place just on a yoga mat or on a meditation cushion. And, you know, the most important part of mindfulness is being able to bring our presence and loving awareness into the world and in everything we do. Mm -hmm. And so for many people, um, cultivating a spiritual practice or mindful awareness can help us to gain like some perspective on ourselves um, of what Ramnas calls the witness, which is like the neutral observer of our lives. Um, the part that reminds us that feelings aren't facts <laughs> and, you know, that there's a broader perspective sort of available to us at any given moment. And so my question to you is like, what does mindfulness mean to you in your daily life? Do you have like a daily mindfulness practice? Um, how does it show up for you, even, you know, off the meditation cushion, just in your daily life? Great. I've just been thinking about this exact same thing. Um, so mindfulness for me, if we could kind of pin down that definition, or at least how I think about it when I use that word, um, means when I can be in the world without thinking about being in the world. I can wash a dish without thinking about washing the dish. Um, essentially experiencing like the raw data of life without um, filtering it through any mental categorization, judgment, planning, analyzing, categorization, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a practice like that takes place on the cushion twice a day. Um, and that started off uh, with like TM. Um, and then um, I learned Vipassana. I did a, you know, a 10 day Vipassana retreat later. And um, now every year, uh, I try to do every year, although the last few years I missed I, before, before last summer, um, I do a solo retreat. So there's a, uh, Buddhist center I go to but on the property in the mountains they have this sort of like a cabin like hidden and they just drive you up there and leave you and so um, I'll be going there in, in late May and I'll spend two weeks um, anywhere from one to three weeks I try to spend there uh, and I'm just completely alone in complete isolation though it doesn't feel lonely at all um it's actually like easier than normal life uh because it's just like nothing's there to upset you so I, I call it sort of like mindfulness for for dummies or like training wheels mindfulness you, you know and so what i'm doing there on that retreat is i'm sitting uh and on that retreat because there's nothing else to do I, except be mindful i sit like five hours a day not all at once and then i practice walking meditation uh, an additional three hours. Um, and in between, I'm either reading spiritual books or eating or sleeping. And I, when I'm reading or eating or preparing food, I try to bring the, the mindfulness to, the, to those things or meditation as well. Um, and so on that retreat, I can get, get into a nice rhythm, it's a really deep presence. 
but like I said, it's like training wheels. There's no, no, no other humans, you know, to like, if you find yourself upset, usually you're doing that because no one else is there. Hey. Um, but I think your question is like so poignant and poignant for me right now, because um, it's like retreat. I read the, the, this uh, quote from Tidnet Han. He said, retreat is about re-entry. Retreat is about re-entry. So what does that mean? That means like when I was younger, I was going to retreat. I was trying to have like a high experience, like something I could brag about, tell like, oh, it was amazing. I did this thing. And it's like, that's a waste. Retreat is supposed to make you more mindful when you go back into the world, into the marketplace, mm -hmm. um, the studio, when I'm on stage, when, in the, when I'm brushing my teeth. Um, so that's something I've been, uh, I want to say struggling, but I think challenged with even in the last few weeks, just reminding myself, you know, it's like a couple of days go by and you're like, well, it's kind of on autopilot there, like for two or three full days, you know, and all it takes is a moment, right? Sometimes you're listening to another person speak and you just can be there fully listening, um, Mm -hmm. and that's really the practice so you know all the the daily practice on the cushion that's like a mini retreat right so that's also about re-entry it's supposed to make us better when we go back if it doesn't make us go be better when we go back to our brothers our sisters our family our, our partners the world then we're wasting our time really and mm -hmm. it's like it's kind of just selfish you know yeah. um so, like by yeah that. yeah so this is a great question my yeah like i i i live like a life of an entertainer i'm a i'm a singer songwriter i go to the studio i run a business i have people that work for me i do concerts and how mindful can i be when i'm when i'm doing all that stuff anyone can do it at the, at the buddhist center alone you know right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think it's a great question one I've been like sort of you know checking myself on this week so yeah that's a great answer it reminds me of um just two things Sharon Salzberg I don't know if you know her she has one of the podcasts yeah. on be here now network she's amazing Absolutely. but every time I find myself sort of slipping or ruminating which you know I do I ruminate so much just like just Few, it's mostly like anticipatory, like what's going to happen if this happens or that happens. And, and then her voice always comes into my head. She always says, um, you can always begin again. She's like, it doesn't matter how many times you slip or how many, you know, stories you tell yourself as you're sitting and meditating, wandering off into like a million fantasies. It doesn't matter how long you've done that and don't get down on yourself for it. Cause you can just always begin again with the next breath. Like that doesn't, yeah. doesn't matter, you know, it's and really important. You yeah, know, it's you like you can build a whole story. I do this sometimes too, where like, oh, how mindful have I been this week or this day? Mm -hmm. Or making a whole like narrative around that. Oh, I'm less present than I was last week, and this kind of thing. And it actually doesn't exist, right? It's like a creative n narrative, and in in the actual present moment, there's no scoreboard, right? right? So, there's no judgment. Yeah, I think is what it is. is. I think Sharon's Sharon's right, of course. Yeah. Usual. <laughs> yeah, Sharon's always right. Um, and then I was thinking about just going through. I mean, so much of what Ramdas taught about was, you know, like you said, finding the mindfulness and the presence in every moment, like as you're chopping wood, as you're carrying water, as you're doing the dishes, like it ultimately our life is made up of these tiny moments that we often miss because we're just so busy thinking about something else. And you know, so little of our life is the retreat portion or the vacation or the, you know, the orgasm, like whatever the thing is that brings us into that high. And ultimately we're always going to come down. So how can we learn to like elevate the baseline a little bit? So we're not just looking for those. We don't need those hits all the time that ultimately leave us disappointed. Um, so yeah, there's a story about, I mean, you know, the story cause you've listened to all the podcasts 10 times, <laughs> but there's a story about, um, when Ram Dass went to visit Neem Karoli Baba in India and told him about that LSD that he was doing and was so excited. And, um, and Maharaji said something to the extent of like, you know, 
you can meet God, but you can only be in the room with him for four hours. Like when you're doing LSD, like you can only, that that's a great thing to do and you can meet God, but you have to come back to earth after that. And so ultimately that's, I think kind of why Ram Dass stopped doing psychedelics so much was because he realized he could only go for a certain amount of time. The highs always have lows. And it was a great like launching point maybe for him. It's not for everybody, but um, you know, I think that whole point of spiritual practice is finding a way to sustain that so that you're not just on a roller coaster all the time. Yeah. Get high your own supply. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so my next question was about, you know, integrating mindfulness into your writing process, you know, but you sort of already answered that. But if there was anything else you wanted to add, just whether you're writing poetry or music or lyrics or, you know, bringing that, that into yeah. your creative process. Absolutely. Right. You know, like with the, when the mind is racing or cluttered, it's very hard for it to be creative, you know, or for like wherever the ideas come from for you to, I guess, hear them when for, there's a lot of chatter. So um, if the question, the spirit of the question is like, you know, does having a mindfulness practice or, or being mindful in general um, help with ideas or creativity in my songwriting Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I think that's um, kind of a brainer. <laughs> yeah. It's I mean, and but I mean, think about it. Like if you're all, if you're so if the mind is like full or racing, like there's no space for new things to pop up, you know, mm-hmm. and that creativity is just new ideas, right? So um definitely that helps. Um it definitely helps. Yeah, very nice. Um So my next question is about, um, so it's about Mount Everest (laughs) because I just have to ask. Um, So, you know, most people on this call, I'm guessing all people on this call probably have not gone to the top of Mount Everest. Um, Who knows if we ever will, but I, I imagine that experience for you was, I mean, I've, I've heard you talk about it being just completely transformative and changing your life. And I'm just wondering, like, obviously without having to climb to the top of Mount Everest, do you have like any takeaways? Like what, what did you bring back from that experience that, that is like continuing to shape your life? If you know, that's like an easy thing to answer. There's a few, there's a few things that come to mind. Um, Everest is a complicated memory. It's something I dedicated um, almost two years of my life to go from like, no, no, experience in mountains never having worn crampons or holding an ice axe to climb the tallest mountain in the world so it was one there was just an incredible amount of pain hard work sweat tear little tears like in the training just like <laughs> that went into climbing that mountain so you know the summit was really emotional making it uh um i knew i knew you know, a year and a half before I committed to, you know, trying to go for that summit, that, that mountain would change my life and not just that mountain, but everything that I would take to take to get ready. Um, but I didn't know how I thought it perhaps would make me feel more proud or strong or sure of myself, but it actually made me a lot more humble and grateful. Mm-hmm. Um, and Perhaps one of the biggest takeaways was not on the summit, but coming down from the summit was actually a lot more important. It's less a uh, sexy thing to talk about, I guess, if you were on the summit, but the summit's actually halfway, right? It, like you made up there and then you have to get right. down. And, and getting down is like success is summiting and getting down. Many, many, I say many people, but many of the people that die on Mount Everest die on the way down. Mm-hmm. because they didn't they had enough energy to make to the top but not down right. that's not success right that's not success right. we trying to summit and come down safely um and so on the way down um you pass literally the mountain is so tall that oftentimes if people do perish um there's no way to get their corpse down mm-hmm. uh, and actually like in my opinion uh, a humble opinion it's maybe unethical to try to get their corpse down 
uh, that's tied into like my spiritual belief, which is like, you know, you're not freaking in there. It, it's a bag of bones. Um, right. Not all people share that belief. So that's and, and people could die trying to save the body too. You know, it's like, that's why- exactly what I'm, what I'm getting to. So yeah, I think it's for me, you know, I had to actually have a conversation with people before I left, which is, you know, if anything, heaven forbid happens to me, I would like a mountaineer's burial, which mm-hmm. is put me in a crevasse or push me off a cliff, the body, not me. Uh, anyway. So yeah, on the way down, you, you pass corpses is the point I'm trying to make. And these are people, some of which have been, their bodies have been frozen there for many years. And, and some of them were alive just a few weeks ago. Uh, and they had the same kind of dreams and, and like, uh, like, I guess delusions of grandeur that I had, you know, and it didn't go the same way. Mm. Uh, and so the takeaway uh, is what a privilege it is to be a living human being, right? Most people are already dead. Um, and me, uh, I don't know if this will be recorded, uh, but for right now, you know, uh, on the initial listening, everyone listening to this call, we're all alive um, in bodies. And maybe we come back or this thing. I, I don't really know. You know, for me, we don't know for sure. But to be in this incarnation, this life right now uh, is, is a privilege, you know. So I do a little like gratitude journaling, try to every day, just like write down 10 things I'm grateful for. And a lot of times something that comes up is like, you're alive. You could not, like you did a really dangerous thing, man. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and you could have not come back from that, but you did. So what, what a gift, what a gift that that's one, one takeaway for sure. No, I think that's really beautiful. Um, Even like, you know, to feel like tired or, or self pity or pain, like those things, I still feel all those things, of course. Um, but at least I get to feel them. Like I that's, get to feel shitty. <laughs> Cause at yeah, least I'm alive. Like in the context of being, you get to feel things because you're still alive at least. Yeah. So that's good. You know? Yeah. It's almost like the the mindset of someone who's had like a near death experience or something. Because I think you mean in a lot of ways you sort of did. It's like you know that was a very dangerous thing to do. And yeah, and I think when people no. come back, you know, even people that die in the hospital and come back, or people that are in car accidents and come back, it's like you never look at life the same because you realize how fragile it is and how it's not guaranteed and not a given on any in any moment. And I think most people walk through the world as if it's a it's just a given that I'm going to be alive today, but it's very much not. And so how can we live each day? Like it's, you know, a privilege to be alive. I think that's really an awesome takeaway. <laughs> yeah. It's a good one. And, and I still walk through a lot of my days like that after you, sure. but yeah. that's why that, that gratitude journal is good. Never yeah. Mind. That's a great practice. I, I started doing that because I was finding myself just, in such a negative mindset for really no reason other than my brain was just spinning. And I started doing that gratitude every morning and it really is like the antidote to anxiety for me. It's just like, Oh, like just the ability to like buy food from my refrigerator. And so many people can, you know, just simple things that like you take for granted every day. It's just wild. Um, So I guess we have to wrap up, but I do have one final question for you. Yeah. Um, So I know on your walk across the country, uh, you asked many people this question, but I'm going to turn it around on you, which is if we pray for you, Mike, what should we pray for? That's a, that's a good one. I'll, I'll have two answers already. <laughs> Probably think of more. If you pray for me, um, pray uh, for my presence that I can go through my life mindful um, and that I can be of service to others. And I think those go hand in hand. I think the more present I am, the more I can be a light to, to others. And uh, that's what I'm what I'm up to. So if, if, if the audience and you could hold those things in your heart, I'll take it. <laughs> Love it. We will, we will hold it all. So it's a beautiful answer. Thanks, Mike. Thanks you, Rachel. 
So it's awesome. Been awesome talking with you. Thank you for sharing your music and your present and your being, your present and your presence. <laughs> your presence is the present. Um, thanks for sharing that with us. And we hope to connect with you again soon. Absolutely. It'll be fun to keep collaborating in some way, shape, or form. So For sure. Thanks, everyone, so much for joining. And we'll see you soon. Bye.